we're becoming more like Lebanon and Brazil in certain aspects. There's a, a sadness, a profound sadness in the whole of Swedish society. Hello and welcome to Unheard, I'm Freddie Sayers. Up until recently, Sweden was a country that anyone on the left of the political spectrum held up as a hero. Then Covid happened and their more liberal response was quite controversial, to put it mildly. And now, as of the past few days, there is a new government in charge in Sweden, which consists of the right-wing parties in coalition. And alongside them, but not actually in government, is the Swedish Democrats, which are often called far-right. And we'll investigate whether that's actually true. Happily, this weekend here in London, we are joined by Ivar Arpi, um, who is normally resident in Sweden, where you run your blog Rock Herger, which and um, podcast alongside it. Yeah. But you're here in town, so we thought we had to catch up and find out what your perspective was. What does this mean for populism, for Sweden, for democracy, and the rest of it? So welcome, Ivar. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Two days ago, a new agreement was signed among the right-wing members of the new coalition in Sweden. This means Sweden no longer has a left, centre-left, social democratic government. It has a right-wing government. Tell us about that. Is this a new right-wing government and how right-wing is it? Yes, it's a right-wing government. But to be right-wing today is to have a firm stance on crime, on migration, especially migration. So everything is about migration. If you're pro-migration, uh, pro-generous uh, migration policies, then you're left-wing, even though you might be a neoliberal when it comes to economic policies and you want flat tax and stuff like that. Uh, so the center party that was part of the uh, support of the social democratic government, uh, they are the most right-wing of all the parties in, this, in the parliament when it comes to economic issues. But they are left-wing uh, nowadays. So that's a realignment of what, is, what it means to be left and right. So, yeah, to, to, to answer a short question with a long, long, long answer, uh, uh, yes, this will be a right-wing government and it, it will be a, a paradigm shift in Sweden, I would say. The party that you just mentioned there, the Sweden Democrats, is the controversial one. This is why people like the New York Times and many other sort of mainstream publications are very anxious about this situation because they think fascism has returned to Europe. We hear about the Giorgia Meloni government in Italy, kind of in concert with this new right-wing Swedish government. And there's a lot of people who are very uneasy about it. Tell us about the Swedish Democrats in particular. I mean, do you, do you support them, for example? I don't support any political party. I don't think you should. I'm very Swedish. I know that here in Britain, uh, newspapers support different parties, and so, but I, I don't support the uh, Okay. Parties, but I, I, yes, I'm in f in for a change of government. So uh, Swedish Democrats, who who are they? Yeah. Where did they come from? There's a lot, rather like the Georgia Meloni party. Yeah. There's this idea they're descended from fascists, even though they may not be now. What's the truth? Do you think? So I think that comparison is interesting and fruitful because um, the the Sweden Democrats, when they were formed in the late eighties, yeah. They've recently published their own white book made by a scientist and, and he concludes that a about a third of the forming members of Sweden Democrats had roots in far-right organizations, neo-Nazi organizations, so they were most definitely on the fringe uh, and extreme. Uh, and uh, and th what they say themselves then as a defense is that th those members after a few years were gone. So uh, And they've moved and tried to uh, be in uh, so to speak, they become more more mainstream, acceptable. And, um, acceptable, yes. And that, that and the the current leadership has been there for uh, since the nineties, and they've been the the primary force behind that change. What have they changed to try and get that more acceptable appearance? Have they actually changed their policy? Because they used to be in favor of repatriation of immigrants. It, are they still in favor of that? Yes, and I would say that that repatriation is something that more parties now are talking about in Sweden. To the Sweden Democrats and to the Swedish people, that's the most important issue together with crime. We've had soaring crime in all over Sweden and we've had uh, a complete uh, change in Sweden when it comes to our, our, our demographics. So we are now uh, have more, a more heterogeneous uh, population than the United States 
had when they had the record high levels of migration during the early 1900s. We have more foreign-born foreign -born people as part of the population than they ever did. And now Swedish population is, when it comes to diversity, you can only compare it to Britain, Holland uh, and France. But there's a, there's a difference that the, the influx of, from the Commonwealth in Britain and from the colonies in, in France and the Netherlands was over a much larger period of time. In Sweden it's 20 years. So the last 10 years and 20 years has, has uh, completely changed how Sweden looks and the challenges we face. So what are the numbers on that? Just 25% of the population in Sweden are foreign born. Uh, so is that a controversial number? Would would every uh, yeah, newspaper I, agree with that? Or yeah, yeah, no, no, no. The number is uh, the Statistical Central Bureau. So it, the, that's uh, a public statistics. So, the, the, but the, of course, the political implications—that's where the controver controversiality <laughs> mm. uh, ensues. So, what so was that means of a, of a roughly ten million, or maybe it's now eleven million population. You know, two or three million are. Two million are foreign-born, and uh, if you look in the younger population, it's uh, people who are foreign-born or have parents who are foreign-born. It's uh, almost forty or forty-five percent of the population in the ages uh, zero to forty-four. And if you look in the big cities, uh, it's a majority of the young population that are either foreign-born themselves or have an uh, migration ancestry. So it's a completely like. Just if you go back 20 years, the cities looked different and we had, we had challenges with integration, but not on a scale like this. So we're in a slightly strange or paradoxical situation that the Sweden Democrats are excluded from the government. They are there in a kind of confidence and supply arrangement with the minority right-wing coalition. They're not allowed into the government, but actually they've influenced all the other major parties in recent years. Um, is, that, is that a fair summary? I think it's a fair summary, but I don't really. I, I, you, 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 if you summarize it like that, you give them too much credit because they are not, they are not geniuses. In Sweden, uh, if you compare to Poland, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, where uh, migration is an issue, it's more of an abstract issue. In Sweden. You cannot go outside the door without, uh, or, or be at your workplace without uh, being confronted by the by the issue, we, because it was such a large influx of people in 2015, for example, and after that as well. So in all, there is no place in Sweden where you can uh, go and you don't see migration. There are no small cities in Sweden where there is not a uh, like 10, 20, 30 percent of the population is either foreign-born or have roots there. So uh, the issue became, the reality was so uh, pervasive that all parties had to deal with it. So Sweden Democrats wouldn't have, uh, the reason people vote for them is that they, they view it like Sweden Democrats has the best answer to this problem. But everybody started talking about it because the whole population is talking about it. And we were talking about nothing else because we see it every day. So I guess you are coming from this at this from a certain angle, you're, you're... No, I'm objective. Well, you're... And neutral. You're... Impartial. Your website is called Rakerga, which means straight right. Yes. So one kind of, you can deduce from that what your um, angle is going to be. I guess the people who disagree with you would say, first of all, what's wrong with that? Um, you know, you, you talk as if uh, we need to find a we can't find a town without immigrants. Well, why, why would you need a town without immigrants? Why are you looking for one? Mm. Uh, I think people will feel uncomfortable with that kind of talk. I mean, here in London, we've been used to a multicultural kind of society for decades and decades. Um, and it appears to continue functioning reasonably well. Mm. Why is it a bad thing that there's been this uh, big influx of migrants? Uh, that's a great question, uh, and I'm glad you asked it because I think sometimes uh, it's you, you, it can be confusing because uh, you talk always talk about it as if it's a problem. Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at a lot of Sweden, we have um, um, amazing success stories as well. We have, I think, 50% of the doctors in Sweden are either foreign-born or, or educated in another country, and and, and other professions as well are. Uh, to a large degree, people from other countries coming in, 
becoming becoming Swedish, the kids are going to Swedish schools, and it's just success stories. And it's ironically, if you look at this debate, now it's two white males discussing this, but if you look in Sweden, if you, in these issues, it's often been that it's like an Iranian-born uh, and another, uh, like an Arab uh, Swede, uh, and they are debating from different different angles about how hard my integration is, and while you're seeing it, they're saying it in perfect Swedish, they've gone to Swedish school, and they have a Swedish education, and they're fully integrated, and one of them is saying integration is not working properly, and the other one is saying it's, uh, we should do this instead. So you have the success stories all, all the time in Sweden. Which you acknowledge. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, uh, and also, I, when you say uh, diversity is a strength, I, I would agree. Up to a point, and and that, that so that is still true. That still rings true. What we've had is a, a very large volume of, of migrants in a very short period of time, and also we have had a very hard time uh, to give them uh, accommodation, and uh, they have had a hard time uh, finding jobs. So. It used to be the way that it, because we had a much smaller influx of Im immigrants, they came to certain areas, then they uh, got a job and moved away. So many of the first waves of migrants, they are, they are basically living in, in Swedish areas now. So they are fully integrated, like the Greeks, the Turks, uh, the Yugoslavs who came earlier and had a much easier time of it. What, what, we ha what is happening now is that people are getting stuck in these areas and there are no ethnic Swedes there. So there are no Swedish, so na no native uh, Swedish speakers in the schools. Uh, there is no contact uh, with the wider society from these areas. And in these areas, uh, criminal gangs have uh, taken over control over large parts of society, and people are uh, captives in their own in their own, in in those parts. So, some people, I guess, would say that this is exaggerated. I mean. You get it's become a sort of right wing meme, hasn't it? That it gets talked about that, that you know there are no go areas, you know, um, explosions, hand grenades, gang warfare is just a daily reality. The police have totally vacated these parts. Is that really true? I mean, do you walk through some of these areas outside Stockholm or outside Malmo? And what is what is the day to day? real life experience there. Is it as terrifying as all that or might they seem like normal functioning areas if you went through them? I think if you compare it to the United States, uh, I mean it's much more dangerous in other parts of the world than in Sweden, of course. And it's not Brazil, it's not the go to a favela or, or you go to Baltimore, it's not the same. But the grenade violence and the bombs are on the same level as Mexico. And that's just facts. People are bombing uh, in the central Uppsala. And you're bombing and you're shooting into uh, like regular apartments in affluent areas. And, and that's mainly officer. intra gang, is it? No. Or between different gangs, different parts of the same immigrant community? Or and also against police, like bosses, in, uh, like a police officers. And uh, so if, if uh, so they are threatened, police officers are threatened and just the other day they shot into the house of uh, a, a police uh, constables, uh, like a higher up officer in the hierarchy. His house was shot up and he lives in an affluent area in Gothenburg, the second largest city in Sweden. And if you go to the more uh, crime ridden areas, I mean daily life continues. It's the same in, in uh, war zones. Children are playing, people are going outside, mostly. Even in Ukraine, children are playing. It's not the same as in Ukraine, but I mean, we have kids who are being killed at the playground because the criminals in Sweden are so reckless uh, in their violence and they have automatic rifles. Um, and, and that's new, that, I that is new. And th at the same time, you have to keep uh, uh, you, you say it's a right-wing uh, meme, so to speak, with no-go areas. There are different trajectories here, because the schools, for example, in some of these areas has actually gotten better. So some of the trends, not all trends are being are worse, but it's, it's still it's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge uh, when, when the crime is so prevalent and it's everywhere and it's in schools and, uh, and it's uh, 
people are afraid, even the police officers can be afraid to work in these areas. Of course they go into these areas. It's not a no-go zone for the police, but if you don't have an errand, as, as a, most Swedes don't, you don't go to these areas. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and that's, uh, so that also, uh, like, increases the, the, the distance between the wider society and these uh, enclaves. enclaves yes. So, I guess there probably would be a good degree of agreement that the waves of immigration in recent years have been mismanaged at least. Is that fair? I mean, across the mainstream political parties as well, there's a sense that integration hasn't been managed as effectively as it should be, that there's a real crime problem. I mean, that's not controversial. Is that, is that right? No, you, you're, we're, I think everyone is in agreement there. Right. So at that point, it's a question of degree, and I want to move to this question of what we do about it, because we talked about repatriation, which is a genuine policy of the Swedish Democrats. Like, if you mention that in the UK context, or in many other countries, it would be, you know, jaw wide open. That is a completely kind of impossible zone to go into. There's a deep sense that once you've welcomed someone into your country, mm. you at that point have responsibility to make it work. And maybe you, you made a mistake previously, but at that point they are a citizen mm. and you have a bond with them. Is that not the same in Sweden? What, what does repatriation actually mean in practice? So I think, um, I think the British, if I can, uh, it's always hard to review another country's policies, but I do think that uh, the way Brexit was handled and the way uh, the Tories interpreted their, uh, uh, the increasing levels of support in the so-called Red Wall and, uh, and what people expected from Brexit they totally uh, was, uh, was stuck in a liberal conservative uh, mindset that what they, were, what they were going to deliver. And I think one of the things that uh, they didn't deliver on was uh, uh, less migration to Britain. And that is one of the issues I think that will be, there's a, there's a space now for uh, Nigel, Nigel Farage again or somebody like him to come in and make a run for it in those issues and see if uh, those votes are really going to Labour or if they are going someplace else. Even Nigel Farage was not talking about repatriation, as no. far as I recall. That's migration. But uh, what I say is that if you if you are an immigrant, and not all immigrants are refugees, you have to say, and if you come to another country and you behave badly and you're not, uh, you don't do your part of it, then I don't think uh, it's too much to ask that then, okay, you go back. And I don't think I if it was a mistake to take them in, I don't think it's a, a something that you should uh, never be able to correct. So for example, right now, the agreement that's on the table between in the new government, between the Sweden Democrats, moderate party, liberal and Christian Democrats, we will have the strictest migration policies in all of Europe. And the reason we will have that is because uh, we were too welcoming. And now we're having seen too many bad consequences of that. And there is a... What are the measures? Just share with the audience. Yes, some, 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 what are some, the details of that? No, I don't have it in front of me. And I, I, I've just read it like, uh, like one, one time. The headlines. The headlines, yeah. I don't, I don't have it in front of me. But one of the one of the things is that uh, if you have, if you are, if you are committing crimes in Sweden, uh, and you are foreign, foreign born and you don't have a citizenship, you should, it should, should, should always that the rule should be that you will be dispelled, dispelled from the country, uh, and it's not, it's not been like that. And also that sometimes the way the rules are are uh, formulated is that. If you have formed a bond with a country, even though you've raped or killed or done something horrible, uh, that will that bond is still so strong according to the law that you are not supposed to be put out of the country, and that will also change. And repatriation has. I, I just have to say that it's been part of the policy for for all governments in Sweden. So we've had repatriation policies in place forever. So you can get money. Well, that's just for criminals. Right? No. 
So if you want to return to your country of origin, you have you can apply to get a uh, a grant and you will be helped by Swedish agencies and that's been in place forever. So this is not that's not new, but the uh, the level of of that grant, the, the, the sum and the level of support and how much of an incentive you will have to uh, go back to your country of origin, that will increase now with this agreement that's in, on the table. So that's, so just to be clear then, so repatriation, because when people hear that, they will think, what, are they rounding up immigrant communities and putting them on planes and sending them home? What you're saying is, it's if they're convicted of a crime, which I'm guessing is a very, very small minority of, you're talking about two million plus foreign born Swedes, mm. I mean, n the, that's not even going to make a dent in that number in terms of people who are convicted of a crime, obviously it's a tiny minority. And then it's people who are voluntarily asking for access to a scheme that gives, gives them money if they want to return to their country of origin. So is there any kind of world in which this makes a impactful difference to the immigration situation? Or is it actually just sort of an atmospheric change where it's sort of making Sweden seem less welcoming in some way? What's the truth of that? No, I, I do think that the, uh, if the people who, who have come are probably going to stay. And I, I th that, that's just the way it is. It's, just, it's the way that is all the time. So new government in place, due to all of these factors, we've now got essentially a not anti-immigration, but very close to anti-immigration Swedish government. I mean, as you say, it's some of the strictest rules in Europe, um, having been one of the most welcoming to immigrants. Yeah. In, in a sense, it's joining Denmark and other countries that have had a, a turn in that direction in recent years. Do you think that fixes it as an issue? Do you think voters will now be satisfied that action has been taken? Uh, or do you think it will carry on? No, it will carry on. Those things are not to be fixed. These are these are problems that we will live with for generations. I mean, it, <laughs> if we live together and we don't meet each other and we have different identities, we speak different languages, we have different cultures, different religions, this is some, not something you solve in four years. This is not something you solve in 10, 20, 30 years. This is something you live with for 100 years. So this is not something, this is, a, this is just a start of something. So do you not have hope that, you know, you, look, I think Germany is a good example here, that after the big wir schaffen das, we can handle it, um, wave of immigration in 2000 and, what was it, 15, there was again the same kind of stories, there were worries about rapes or, or criminal gangs in Germany and there was incidents in Cologne and elsewhere, and fast forward a few years and actually they have handled it. The, the, those incidences are less common than they used to be and there is a sense overall in which the worst fears of the populist right in Germany didn't play out and they did accommodate that community. Why can't the same happen in Sweden? I'm not so sure that what your description of Germany is correct to say first and foremost and I don't think Britain, France uh, are success stories either. Uh, we ha you have huge conflicts between people, groups. You saw uh, gangs of Hindu uh, nationalists and Pakistanis fight in the streets of, I, I fail to remember which, which city it was. But those kinds of things are, are part of Britain now and it will be a part of France and it will be a part of Sweden. So this, these are not things that one government will, can wish away with a few policies. It's just the start of something and it will be uh, long in the making and you cannot correct mistakes that were made over a course of 40 years with just a few few in a few years so this will be this is a question of uh, a, des a destiny question so to speak like what kind of country will Sweden be in, f in uh, two decades three decades it's a question of survival it's a question of Swedish identity and it's also a question of will we be a country where we uh, live where we share institutions with each other or we have separate institutions and we try to manage the level of conflict like in Lebanon or Brazil. In Lebanon it's of, of course based on um, along sectarian lines. In Brazil it's class uh, that's the, the rich and the poor live separate lives. 
and in Sweden right now we are we're like <laughs> we're we're becoming more like Lebanon and Brazil in certain aspects uh, and uh, I, I there's a uh, a sadness, a profound sadness in the whole of Swedish society, and uh, people are very pessimistic. Swedish, if you go back 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, Swedes were always optimistic, like oh, my children will have it better than I did, mm. and now a majority says the other way, and that's new. And it, and it, I mean, that's it, not it just has Sweden. To do with that, that is, you find that in countries across the West, I would say now, yeah. a similar effect, but. You're sounding pretty pessimistic, Eva. I've got to say, I mean, it's bleak, the vision you're presenting. This is a, of a, only a country that gets more divided. Uh, you end up in some kind of Lebanon-style situation. Where's the hope that we can actually reach across these barriers? I mean, I, you know, I guess your critics might say, instead of investing energy in kind of highlighting the divisions and the need to you know, have stronger repatriation policies or whatever, why do we have going to these areas and seeing what needs to be done to bring those people in to society and to try to, you know, rediscover a single common vision? Is, is it the, just the, naive? Is that what you think? And yes, it's, it's, a, it's a naive vision that uh, contact breeds uh, closeness. Sometimes you meet people and you think the more you meet them, the less you like them. And is that's that how you feel? No, uh, but I, I'm just saying that certain groups, let's take Hindu nationalists and Pakistanis. I don't think it's a good idea if they live like together, for example, if they have such opposing views and they've brought that conflict to Britain. Then perhaps it's better if they don't live as close to each other because they have such opposing views on so many issues. Closeness will not breed uh, uh, closeness of heart there. It will breed conflict. And sometimes that is just the way it is. People are very different. And, and I, I, I don't think you should be naive and think that people should just mix. Uh, and that will, that will uh, be, be the cure for it. I don't think social engineering... We have tried that for a long time in Sweden. And it, it didn't work out that well all the time. The, the, the thing is that if you, if you talk about what, what you're afraid of, then, you can, uh, then it highlights what you feel are the challenges. So Lebanon is the challenge there, is that how can people live together in a common areas even though they have different religions and different ethnicities. So you don't become Lebanon. So of course it's, a, it's not an utopia you're talking about, but you, you, you talk about something you want to avoid. And the same with Brazil. Do you want to have a country where there is a so the the the, um, the cleavages between classes and between the rich and poor are so deep that they are basically talking about two different countries, and, and and that so that's the challenge now for Sweden. Like, how can we keep the common the common the common areas, the commonalities? But you um, seem to be saying we can't. I mean, I've got to ask, what's the Ivar Alpi prescription here? If we if we put you in charge of the Swedish government, uh, you accept that the people who have arrived. Are basically there to stay, give or take a few thousand. What's your what's the, the good plan here? Yes, some of the good plans are. Um, I, I would say that what what they've managed now in government, we will see how it plays out. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't think problems are solved in a, a four year period mostly. But uh, many of the of the um, our own rust belt, so to speak, uh, mirrors the one in. Uh, uh, here in, uh, in in Britain and also in the United States, how how you can help them and how you can how you can bring in more jobs for working class and you can have a better situation for them and there there you can see that Sweden Democrats have more of a left wing policy. So I would say that you should you should you need some sort of um, le some left wing policies are actually good when it comes to economics. You need more more of state interventionism than we've had. Uh, and so, and basically, I, I think you have to be patient with some of these things. I don't, I don't believe in a, uh, the, the, the only way, historically, that you, you make people the same is by a lot of violence. And that's the only way it's ever been done. Like, if you look at China, like the way people became Han Chinese, why everybody's saying that they're Han Chinese, 
It's not because they are Han Chinese. It's because they've been extremely oppressed over the course of thousands of years. And it's the same in... Uh, if you look here in, uh, here in Britain, the only reason you got rid of the, uh, the troublesome Scottish highlands, it was but just you went up in the, into the highlands and removed them and put them in the lowlands so you could control them. So all, all, almost everything you can do uh, to make people the same that's been done historically is beyond the pale of the way we are, we are conducting ourselves as a civilized nation. Now mm. you can only do it by trying to convince people that they should join. But I think there's an argument to be had about more optimism. So why are, why are, why are you optimistic? Well, I'm, I'm not you? saying I'm optimistic, but I, I feel like there's almost a requirement to be more optimistic than that, because otherwise it's just pure fatalism. And then you get into kind of number counting and general drift towards a more divided society and the fears of kind of you know, white people um, becoming minorities. And you get into a very divisive sort of world there. Whilst I do think London, for example, is a success story, broadly speaking. Um, yeah, there are examples like the one you've mentioned in places in the north of England, and there are parts of East London like that where communities are very sort of homogenous. But broadly speaking, I think the UK is a success story of how you can have quite high levels of immigration and not have violence. Um, and you know, there'll be parts of America, no doubt, that would be similar. Normally it's the more affluent parts. You know, so London is a rich part of the country overall. Um, and it makes it a hell of a lot easier for everybody to get along and for there to be a shared sense of purpose when the economy is doing well and where people are affording to make their lives better. I think it gets much harder when things are going badly and people sort of turn against each other. So maybe that's some cause for optimism that you know, if the Swedish economy does well and there, is, there are jobs and there's money to go around and there are programs to bring in people from different cultures, um, you know, maybe this bleak, divided future doesn't need to happen. Yeah, let's, let's hope so. I just think that, uh, uh, not, not to be impolite, but I think that's a privileged uh, view of it. And I, I share the privilege <laughs> Because I know a lot of people from, I, 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 th that's why I'm, I, uh, sometimes you talk about the division between anywheres and somewheres. And I think both you and me are part of the anywhere. I'm, I'm half mean, Swedish, I'm, half English. I'm yes, definitely. and I'm here in London talking to you. So I just flew here and I'm flew, fl flying back. Uh, so, but I, I think that division is really, it's, it's not true because some, many, many of the so-called somewheres are anywheres in that they like Different, they like to travel and they like, but they also like to have a sense of place and continuity. And uh, if you are if you are a part of the uh, the rich world, where the people you are meeting from different kinds of cultures, they are also very similar to you in your in, in the outlook on life and the ed levels of education. And you're not seeing the the problematic parts of uh, diversity. So I would say that London is a great example of. Most of London is it, of, of, of how it can work, and many parts of Stockholm as well. Uh, but the, the the troublesome parts of migration is seen in other parts of the country, in Sweden, and uh, in in the same in in many European countries, where those people who who have come. If you look at the, the people who have come to Sweden, we have the if you compare to other European countries, we have the least educated uh, people with the highest rates of analphabetism of all immigrant populations in all of Europe, while the ethnic Swedes are one of the most highly educated, least uh, most literate populations. So the divide between majority Swedes and our mi migrant populations is huge. And that's also something that makes for another, another experience of migration than, for example, a country like Britain, where uh, uh, many of the migrants coming here are coming are, have a higher degree of education and even when they come. So you, you also have, uh, not all migration is the same and not all experiences and challenges faced, facing you are the same when it comes to migration. Clearly that is a failure of 
the Swedish policy. I think uh, most people would agree with that. If these gaps in education and attainment are so wide and the failure to integrate, failure to give proper employment opportunities to people after you've welcomed them in, what do you think it says, if anything, about the Swedish character? Um, I don't know if it's possible to even generalize as broadly as that, but they're thought of, the country is thought of as being, you know, sort of optimistic, left liberal kind of paradise often, um, and that they sort of got it all sorted. But there's something in this inviting so many people in and then failing to actually truly welcome him that is a little bit, well, it's, it's anxious making about what the Swedish character really is. Do you think we can make any statements like that? I think you have to bring in the character of the migrants and uh, what kind of people and how, how they are. Because it's not just a question, it's sort of a um, chauvinistic way to think that the, your character is the one deciding thing when it's a meeting of two, a meeting of peoples. So it's not just a question of how the Swedes are, it's a question of how the people coming into the country are and what they want and what they, their views, uh, dreams and hopes are. And many people come into Sweden, they don't come to Sweden to become Swedish. They come to Sweden because maybe they couldn't be Kurdish in their country of origin, or they couldn't be uh, Shia Muslim in, because they lived in a Sunni-dominated country, or they, they, they come because uh, they were oppressed like the Hussars of Iran, with uh, their country of origin is Afghanistan, but most of them lived in Iran and they were oppressed there. So. You, you, have to, you have to take that into consideration as well and what they have with them and how far uh, they are uh, in their values, views and dreams from the, the, the people uh, in the country they are coming to. Uh, so that it's, the, it's the meeting that's, that's interesting and, and of course it's a failure but I, 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 do, I would say that it's not the failure of any policy in Sweden. This, it's not a failure of integration policy or schools or, or job policy or not, nothing like that. It's, there was too many who came too fast and no country, I would challenge any country, it's never been done before, that level as, uh, that we had, uh, and, and, and you'd be able to integrate them into a, into a whole. So it would always be a failure. Some mistakes were made, you could have done something better, but if you're doing it on that level, you will always fail. And it's not a question of Swedish culture, Swedish character. You could have the, the best, <laughs> best culture and character in the whole wide world. Uh, you would still fail. Let me ask you to broaden out um, finally here. You've painted, I've got to say, this quite bleak picture of Sweden's future. Put it in context for us of the wider European or even Western moment, because we've talked about Giorgio Meloni in Italy, clearly Eastern European countries one by one have become much more nationalistic, much more right wing, quote unquote. Um, and there are substantial minorities in other Western countries like France who still vote for these so-called far right parties. It does feel like there is a turn against that kind of cosmopolitan global world dream um, and future that we were brought up believing was a near certainty that mm. so-called end of history moment most definitely feels over. Where do these trends lead us, do you think? Is it to ever smaller kind of nation states that are ever more uniform and trying to kind of re reduce the, that mixing? What, what does the future look like? Yeah, so I, I would uh, say that we're still stuck in the end of history. Because uh, it, what, what Fukuyama said that's, I think, not appreciated enough is that there is own, no other game in town that inspires people. So uh, it used to be that there was, was an alternative view in the socialist international that was a challenge to the capitalism of the West. And, uh, and this is a challenge to all the right-wing and left-wing populists uh, all over Europe. Is, uh, like, what is your alternative view of the future? And they and uh, they've been lacking in, in answering that. But I, I would say there are there are signs that these parties are uh, be inspiring each other more and having a deeper 
deeper connections to each other uh, and learning from each other and also cooperating on an EU level. So they switched from being anti-EU to becoming pro-EU, but they want to turn EU into something else. Uh, one of the top brass of the EU uh, said that we should strive to make European countries less homogenous so that we take away the uh, populist uh, fire. So that, that you have that uh, movement as well. And so you see a sort of showdown between the yeah. populist forces and the kind of authoritarian tech yeah. authoritarian forces. Yeah, and, and, and that's basically also a, a, a tension within liberal democracy. Which part of it that you uh, put your emphasis on? So the liberal part or the democracy part? And the, the populists, of course, they put the emphasis on democracy. People should have a vote on everything. People should have influence over their countries. We should take power back to the people, back to the nation state. And if people don't want migrants, uh, then they should be able to vote, or vote on it. And then you have the liberal part of it, which is minority protection, human rights. We've signed these conventions. These are, these are the ru rules-based uh, order. And uh, there are, uh, <laughs> to, for the economy to function well, we need a certain set of rules. And uh, so there, there's a tension there. And that I, I would say that in the future, that tension I, I, I only see increasing. And it becomes a kind of elite versus less elite clash then, doesn't it? Because yes. clearly the liberal part is more emphasised by people who are kind of at the higher ends of the establishment or income scale. And the populist yeah. part is emphasised by people who aren't. So you're almost in a kind of internal tensions, possible civil war kind of zone with, if, if these trends just carry on exaggerating. Yeah, and the civil war, I would say it's a much higher risk in countries like the United States, at least in many of the populist parties, they don't have the... If you, if you talk about Meloni, for example, the, the, the fascist uh, and the uh, boogeyman, I mean, there, there's in, in, in her case, there's a very clear-cut uh, evidence that it was the old fascist party translated mm. and, and then became the brothers. So the question is, is it still a fascist party or is she more of a populist, right, con socially conservative part. Now, I would argue that that's more important now. It's not, it, it, it can still be dangerous if, if, you, if you view her policies as dangerous, but the, the characteristics of the fascists and the communists and the Nazis in the, in the early 20th century was that they had, uh, they fielded uh, organ paramilitary organizations that were a physical threat to people. And, and we're not seeing that in Europe. In the United States, you have militias and stuff, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert in how how uh, how many crimes they are committing, but I'm, I mean, people are very armed there, and that's not the same. It's not happening uh, with the Sweden Democrats, and I mean, the Meloni, uh, the brothers of Italy, they are not marching in the streets, so the, the threats are are elsewhere. I would say it's not the street violence is not the is not the thing people should be af afraid of. There are other more uh, scary things uh, that, that, that will happen, I think. I'm going to take that as a moment of almost optimism. Well, there was a <laughs> the, the fact that we're not having impending civil war and impending street violence, I'm taking as Eva's moment of sunshine on this, this well, hour. So I'm going to. It's, it's you. I, 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 I can be optimistic. I, I feel like I've, I've been pegged. You, you, because every question you, you start, that's very pessimistic. But then you ask a question that I have to answer in a pessimistic way. It's, it's your fault. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you the floor now. Give us a, a, what is the optimistic scenario we should take away with us, if there is one? I, I would say that in, in Sweden right now, we have a lot of uh, things going well. It's, it's the country is great in a lot of ways, and it still is. It's just that the challenges are, are huge. But I mean, integration is, is working as well. So and many of the things I'm saying it's, it's still real, but uh, I think we have we have a strong economy uh, compared to Italy, for example. We ha we have we have a lot of things going for us, uh, and integration is working. It's just the, it's just the Rorschach test of Sweden Democrats. That's how you like. Are are we are we right now in 1933 in Germany, or are we someplace else in in 2022 uh, Sweden? And uh, if you ask the left wing, then it's 1933 in Germany. And if you ask the right wing, we are uh, in 2022 finally starting to rise to the challenge.
So I, I'm optimistic uh, for this government to do something. Ivar Arpi, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Ivar Arpi, a Swedish journalist, formerly of Svenska Dagbladet, which is the big broadsheet over in Sweden, and now editor of his own website called Straight Right. So no ambiguity about what his political angle is on this, although I did try to push back a little bit and uh, explore some of his ideas. Clearly, what's going on in Sweden is interesting, it's significant, it's concerning, and it probably represents similar kinds of situations happening in other countries around Europe that is going to continue playing out. We would like to investigate it more. There is a plan afoot to actually go to Sweden in December and find out for ourselves. But until then, thank you for tuning in. This was Unheard.